we are I believe that we are now live, sir. All right. All right. So let me see. How's everybody doing? I'm here live with my man, Dr. B, Dr. Brian Leander. And it's important that we, uh, we set the tone, right? So here you go, sir. all right how's everybody doing this is dr brown i'm here with dr brian lee and the title of our discussion today is follow the leader examining best practices for educators as well as religious leaders during a crisis pandemic um, however you like to title it so the first thing i'd like to do is to introduce to you my mans my og my brother um dr brian leander um dr brian leander if you could please introduce yourself and give us a little bit of uh, your history, your background. Sean, it's good to talk to you uh, with other people listening. This should be <laughs> this should be uh, interesting. So the first thing I'd like to do is introduce to you my man's my old. Sean, I'm hearing uh, a readback of what you just said. That's why I, I paused. Are we good? Okay, I think we are. So, okay, introductions, right? Uh, I have known Sean for Hold on. 20 I'm doing something wrong. Okay. You're good. Go, go, go. Okay. So, uh, I've known Sean for over 20 years, probably about 25 years. Uh, and uh, I, we go back to being part of the same church family. My background is that uh, at least my educational background is that I had a, an epiphany about, uh, I guess, 15 years ago that led me to studying leadership. Um, so my master's was at a, a Jesuit school, actually Gonzaga University. Uh, Y'all know them probably because they have an extraordinary uh, division one basketball program, but they're actually a, a really extraordinary school. And embedded in that master's program was uh, strong foundations around servant leadership. So uh, that started me on this journey to understanding uh, what effective leadership looks like, how to, how to um, recognize it, how to develop it became my pursuit. Uh, so following the work that I did, at, the learning I did at Gonzaga, I really I really wanted to pursue leadership development and strategies for leadership development based on, on practices like servant leadership and transformational leadership. But I, I, I was prompted to, to study a little bit more. So I went back to school and did a PhD in organizational leadership. And that refined even more of what my thinking about leadership looks like. And I started to theorize about about the converse of leadership, which is, in my estimation, misleadership. Maybe I'll talk a little bit more about that if it's in, if it's in the context. But uh, yes, there is leadership, and then there are practices that look very much like leadership. Uh, it's like a counterfeit bill, and it look and, and we categorize that as misleadership. Anyway, so leadership development be became and is, I think, my focus. I think it's really where I stand now, both uh, in the academic realm and where I stand in even in, in the Christian 
realm. I'm a, I'm a believer. I've uh, been a believer for, again, over 20 years. And I think that my calling is around developing the next level of Christian leaders, particularly around the issue of social justice. So I'm at Adelphi University in the role of manager of training and development. I manage training and development for all the faculty and, uh, and staff at the university. Um, I'm an adjunct there as well as, and also at Evangelical Theological Seminary. That's about as much as I want to share. Oh, I'm married 24 years, almost 24 years, and have three uh, lovely children that are on. I think there's some, I think they're on here. Um, they might chime in at some point. All right, great, man. And I see that you, uh, you shaved your beard down. Um, I don't think that was necessary, but you want to look. It wasn't, it, except my wife made me do it. And I, I followed the leader, so there you go. I don't think is necessary. <laughs> you tell her that. <laughs> um, so you're born and raised in Brooklyn, correct? No, I was you're not. not. I, was, I was born in Guyana, and my family Guyana? migrated to Brooklyn, Crown Heights, uh, during the seventies. I was an eight-year-old, so I grew wow. up in Crown Heights during the seventies and eighties. Wow. Okay. And you've been a disciple. I would say for what, about 27, 27, 28 years. years. Yeah. Right. And just for everybody that's looking on, when I say disciple, I don't mean necessarily membership in a specific congregation. Um, he's a God fearing Christian um, that happens to worship uh, in a different congregation. I believe it's hope. Some hope. Hope uh, Long Island. Yeah. Hope Long Island, which I think is awesome. And I just want to say, man, you know, everybody, you know, young black men who are looking, everybody needs that older brother, that person that you can look up to and aspire to be like. And, and Brian is definitely that guy for me. Um, he, he took me to a different place in terms of me seeing myself, not just as a spiritual person, um, but a man of intellect and wanting to study and learn more and be excellent in that way. And so I just wanted to give you your flowers while you're alive, bro. I think you're amazing. And you've been talking about social justice for a long time. And there's a lot of people who paid a very heavy price for speaking about it in different circles. Um, but it's great to have this platform so we can have a different type of conversation. Yeah. Um, so help us out. There's people who fear and love God and we are going through this mm. and we do not know what to do. We want to pray and trust, but we wanna do more. Mm. We feel like probably we're in sin mm. for wanting to do more. Um, sometimes we feel like we may be treated a certain way if we do more than just pray and trust. Um, what are your thoughts about what Christians should be doing or feeling in this moment um, mm. during the crisis? Well, first, I, I've got to tell you, I'm a little stunned that anybody should feel like they're in sin because they want to do more. And I almost want to explore that. I mean, where is that coming from? Um, and maybe we will at, at some point. I don't think that's what the issue is. I think there's a yearning. There should be a yearning on the part of every believer for the cause of justice. I'm more concerned about the, the Christian who does not feel the same yearning. And here's why, and I'll have to share a, my, a PowerPoint with you, okay? I want, want to share some slides, is that all right? Yeah, um, sure. Just whenever you get a moment, just enable me to share my screen. You're good. So this is the only part so sometimes when, you know, answering questions like this, I have to, I have to go back to some things that I think are really foundational. Um, and so I want to do that so that you don't think that I'm just pulling things out of the air and making things up. Okay, so this is, this is how I'm going to choose to answer this particular question. Uh, so, as I said, there should be a yearning for justice in the heart of every believer. And the reason for that is because it's a yearning 
that God has, and he, he places it on our hearts. Um, so feel good that you feel bad. Uh, you, you should be feeling this sense of, I must do more, because I think that's calling. That's the Holy Spirit prompting you to, to do more. And I think the frustration is, well, what does that more look like? And I think the frustration sometimes comes also when we're looking to our leaders to tell us what that more looks like. Uh, and I think there's another level of frustration too when those leaders we look to do, do not have the same prompting and yearning that we do. Uh, I hope that resonates with some people. So, you know, for the believers on this call, let me, let me just kind of tell you that God is, is yearning for justice. And, and so here's how I frame this. When I look back at, at the Old Testament, I, looked at, I look at the founding of the nation, of the people of God, right? Israel, Judah, the founding of them. There were some founding principles that God insisted upon, core values, as it were. And one of them very strongly was, was, was justice. You know, I, don't, I won't read my PowerPoint slides. I know you're reading them. I want you to read them. Uh, but I, I do love the one in Proverbs, right? The exercise of justice is joy for the righteous, but it is terror for, for the workers of inequity. So the exercise of justice, not just, okay, let's pray about it. The exercise, that, Im that implies a practice. We are released to practice justice. Uh, but then you look at Deuteronomy 16.20. I mean, this is not even wishy-washy here, right? This is very, very direct. Justice and only justice you should pursue. Justice and only justice you should pursue in this land that I'm about to give you. In fact, cursed is, is he who distorts justice that is due to an alien or an orphan or a widow. And all the people should say amen. In other words, everybody should be in agreement to this. Amen is a commitment. I hope you, so, so if you start with that as a foundation, right? You say, well, Brian, okay, this is way back then. How does this, how does this, how do you bring this forward into our time? What, are we still being prompted? Well, if you don't have a justice agenda, then you don't have a Jesus agenda. Because here's what Paul says about Jesus. He came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who are near. For through him, we both have our access to one spirit and the father. So then you are no longer strangers or aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. I won't read the rest of it, but because I want to give you some context, but you can read the rest of it as I say this. This point about being strangers and aliens, here's where it comes about. At the time that Jesus was born into that community, there, were, there was an alien class. There were a class of people who could not get full citizenship in, in, in the, the community because they didn't have a genealogy or their genealogy record didn't connect them completely to, to, to Adam. I'm sorry, not to Adam, to Abraham, okay? Genealogy was like your passport. It was, it was the reason that you would be considered a Jew. There are two things that you had to do. Show your genealogy and show that you had a record of, today we have bar, mitzvah, bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs. Show that as a man, you had a record of being circumcised, okay? Circumcision was, I'm sorry, go ahead, Sean. Uh, that's a very interesting thing to prove. But go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so somebody in the family would would, would confirm that, that you 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 had it done. And this is why Paul talks about cutting off the sinful nature. But by the way, that whole vision of cutting off that illustration. Um, anyway, <laughs> um, so now that you're all of you on this call are getting a sense for what my banter has been with Sean for twenty years. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so you had these first class citizens, and then you had what were considered aliens. And you and me, Sean, will probably be considered aliens. Uh, we were allowed to live, but we were second class. Now, we could have been proselytized. So let's say that we converted to Ju Judaism. Now we're living according to the law. 
many of us were still considered aliens. Even though we converted to Judaism and we were circumcised and we committed to serving God under the law, we went to the temple, we committed to all of the practice, we were still marginalized. We were still second-class citizens. That's the construct that they were operating under. So when Paul writes this to the church in Ephesus and says, look, you were once aliens, they know what that means. It's like today, someone saying to Americans, you were once black people, but now you no longer are marginalized because you're in Christ, you are people, you have full citizenship. Well, that sounds familiar too, right? Didn't Paul write about having full, full citizenship? So that's where this is coming from. But you are fellow citizens here. There's no first class. There's no second class. There's no Jew. There's no Greek. You know the scriptures. You know he's talking about that. So that's the context. Jesus had a justice agenda. And that is bringing everyone into an equitable and equal relationship with God. Not only in heaven, but here on earth. So if you're yearning, if you're right now on this call and you're going, I feel a stirring in me and this is making me angry and this is making me want to do something, then give credit to the Holy Spirit. He's still alive and he still has work to do and maybe he wants to do some work through you. Question. So now, because I have different people on the call and that's, that's very clear if I'm Christian, um, that justice is Jesus's agenda and to not act is, is going against Jesus's agenda. Um, what about educators, right? So you have teachers who work in the educational system who sometimes feel like, we, we just to be clear, we have white people on the line, Latinos, principals, superintendents, a bunch of different people, parents, um, and they kind of feel like, well, that's all well and good, but that's not, you don't do that in the classroom. I'm here to teach math. I'm here to teach algebra. Uh, my job is to teach social studies. I'm not paid to teach about social justice or black history or anything else. You also have educators who feel like, I want something to happen now in my school. Um, what are your thoughts on that? For educators, mm -hmm. people that aren't necessarily, uh, people who don't necessarily follow the Bible. Yeah, yeah. So I want to count for, for you too. So you, I was a teacher. Sean, you know this. I taught, I taught at Wingate High School uh, for several years. Uh, I taught at uh, Windanch Middle School as well. And I also taught when I was in Georgia. So, so what I believe is that when you're a part of a system, like the educational system, of course, I, I work at a university now too, You've got to be mature enough to recognize what equity looks like. And if you're teaching in a public school in New York, you also, to, to, to your credit and to the credit of students, have to understand what inequity looks like. And if you have those basic understandings, then you realize that you are working in a system that puts the beneficiaries at a disadvantage. So they're working from a position of disadvantage, right? They are working from a position of, uh, of, of inadequate support uh, at, mul at multiple levels. And if you're well enough educated to be a teacher, you should probably have a sense for what better looks like. You might've experienced better schools than the schools that you're in. So if you decide that you're gonna teach or be an administrator and settle for less than you expected for yourself, boy, this sounds really harsh, but shame on you. Now, if you're on this call, I doubt whether the shame should be on you. You're trying as well to advance an equity agenda in, in the classroom, in the system. And you're probably just as frustrated as those Christians on this call who are going, ah, I feel this prompting to do more, right? I feel this prompting to bring forward more than just reading, writing, and arithmetic. That shows you how old I am. I'm still thinking in terms of arithmetic. But mm -hmm. you're thinking in terms of prom promoting fairness, 
and promoting justice. Well, I think you probably have seen il illustrations like this, right? So imagine this, this baseball game is the system that you're working in, right? People are on the field, uh, people know their roles on the field, and there are people watching on. And imagine that the people watching on are our students. So they're watching us, they're participating, um, but, the, but they're the onlookers in this illustration. Well, equality looks like, all right, we recognize that our students are different. They have different capacities, different intellectual capabilities, different support levels. So we're gonna equally distribute resources to them so that they can get over the barriers. Obviously you have to recognize that they're barriers too. So the fence represent, represents a barrier. It might even be a justifiable barrier, right? You need a fence to separate them from us. Okay, whatever. But if, you, if you're operating from an equity agenda, you recognize that some students need more than others. And since the resources are limited, you're not operating in a way that, that encourages others with the authority to distribute those resources so that the, the persons with the greater need receive what they, 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 can, they need and the people who don't need, well, they don't need it, okay? So that's the next level. I'm not just a teacher, but I'm a member of the system with an equity agenda. Well, the second image is, is even more relevant because sometimes it's not about distribution of, of the resources. Sometimes it's about building bridges or building a ramp or building and innovating and creating something new. That's part of your responsibility too, not just to be a teacher, it's to innovate. Now this third image you might not have seen. Sometimes you've got to recognize that the barrier can be removed or changed in such a way as to create access for everyone. So sometimes instead of just being a teacher, you've got to be about the business of being uh, a hand in reconstructing, tearing things down, building them anew, looking at things differently. So you see, I was talking to Christians before, but really I'm talking about everybody. This is, this is an example of what it means to live as a fully engaged member of the society, whether you're in the education system or you're in, in the church or some other institution. I hope this helps. Right, so what, I, what I've been trying to help teachers with is, so you have teachers, for example, in a very practical way, are they're in schools where when a conversation around race comes up, they're alienated, isolated, um, people treat them a little bit funny. Mm. Um, I've seen, I've seen it, you know, I'm not gonna go into details, but friendships, you, you lose friendships. Mm. This is in the educational system and also in church, right? When you start to talk about race, things shift. Um, and we agree, yes, we need to make sure that everyone has access and that we're talking about it, but how do you, what do you have to say to people who are afraid of the isolation that is going to happen? It is going to happen. Yeah. The labeling that's going to happen. This is, a, this is what always takes place. Anytime you start talking about race in certain spaces, people act different. Us being on this call together as brothers in Christ from different congregations is going to lead to people behaving differently. How do you cope, man? Like, how do you, like, what, you know, like, what do you do? Like, and because people are, they want to talk about it, but they're afraid and they don't want to seem like the angry person and they don't want to yeah. seem like they're bitter, but it's just, it's just too obvious not to. So your thoughts. Yeah. So that's a hard one. So yeah, if you're talking about an isolation that uh, former President Obama uh, articulated that he didn't expect to, to feel. The sense of being in a crowd of hundreds and millions of people on looking and still feeling absolutely alone. Okay, so for me, I, I, I got to start with definitions and frameworks. And so for, for, for you who feel isolated as you step out 
and take the kind of role that I'm talking about, right? Where you, you now have an agenda. <sighs> Ask yourself this, am I a leader? Mm -hmm. I think it's important because if you, if you understand that you're a leader because you're willing to step out into these spaces as boldly as I'm prescribing, then you'll find some comfort even in your isolation. Yes. Right? Uh, if, if leadership looks like this, you know, influencing people so that they will strive willingly towards achieving a group's goal, then it doesn't have to be ascribed upon you. It doesn't have to be that somebody gives you a title to be a right. leader. It's, it's upon your own initiative, recognizing that you can use your influence for the greater good. In fact, most definitions of leadership that I studied as a, a, in a PhD program and a master's program, they have one thread running through them. They have several threads, but the key thread is, is influencing. It's influencing. The other threat, thread is relational. So even though you may fear um, being isolated, more often than not, Maybe you won't have as many friends, but you will have the genuine relationships that you the need. Right ones. You have the right ones. Yeah, you will have it because leadership is relational. Re leadership is attractive. As much as it will repel some, it will attract others. Mm. In fact, the truth of the matter is for many of you on this call, I'm assuming that if you are, for those of you who are sort of on the fence, you know, do I step out or do I not? I'll tell you, there are probably some people around you just waiting for you to step out so that they can embrace you in a, in a, in a more authentic relationship, as it were. So I get the fear, but I can tell you from my experience and from those I've studied, once you step into the side of justice, you will find that you have the right relationships to uphold you. Hmm. Good. Um, in terms of in terms of systems and structures, when you look at congregations, we'll go into education as well. But in terms of congregation, again, we're not speaking about any one specific congregation, but yeah, yeah. based on a, the research that you've done, what are some patterns and trends and 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 structures that certain congregations have in place that you worry about or you're concerned about or what are some systems and structures that congregations that ha have in place that are working in mm. terms of addressing social justice diversity um that you could share with us again yeah. it's a it's a, a wide range of believers and, and different people on the line um but what's working based on your research or yeah. what worked? that was my question so i went into my phd program uh with a with a probably about a 60 percent clear definite clear idea of what i wanted to do in the dissertation and by the second or maybe the third year i was pretty clear, probably like 90 percent clear on what it is i wanted to study and so my dissertation is a study of leadership in what i call now diversity oriented churches so if you googled diversity oriented churches you'll see my name attached to it because it was a it was a, a phrase or a, a term that I coined when I looked at churches that call themselves multiracial, multi-ethnic, and multicultural. I realized that they were very much very similar enough that those constructs could be melded into this term diversity oriented. So what's that? Diversity oriented assumes that the nature of the church in North America and in many other places, to be quite honest with you is not towards diversity. It's towards sameness and similarity and, and homogeneity, right? In fact, there's some principles uh, that, that a lot of church denominations embraced through the, the 60s and 70s and even the 80s called the homogeneous unit principle. And it basically said that uh, the best way to evangelize and to build a church is to build it among the same, same groups or, or same people groups. And it was derived from an observation of, of church building in, in India it, where we have caste systems. And so you, you had some resistance to people becoming 
members of the church because they didn't want to be members of this or members of a church with people of a different caste. Of course, people of a lower caste. They were certainly welcomed being with people of a higher caste. But but this person who cr created this this principle, uh, McGovern, said, "Hey, I think there's some genius in us building churches around sameness." Well, it wasn't much real genius because the church in North America has been built around that for as long as the church has been in North America. You know, Martin Luther King says that that Sunday morning still remains the the most segregated day of, of the year, of the of the calendar week. Uh, you might have experienced that in some of your churches, right? Uh, so I did a dissertation that looked at, well, what makes a church orient toward diversity? What What's happening there? And what's the relationship between leadership and that? So that's my doctoral dissertation. Uh, and so you asked me some sort of structural issues that I'm gonna show you the good and the bad really quickly. So a couple of learnings. For a church to orient itself to true diversity, not just tokenism. So tokenism is putting different, you know, inviting different color people uh, so that you can have this sort of mosaic that, that looks good but you're not inclusive of them. So diversity without inclusion is tokenism. So there are a lot of churches that, that, that want diversity, but aren't inclusive, do not foster a sense of belonging. The ones that are effective at that have an agenda, a clear justice agenda. They see diversity, inclusion, and equity, all of those things as connected to Jesus's justice agenda. So for as much as they want to break down the barriers of race, they're breaking down barriers wherever they're erected. They're looking at scriptures, uh, like when Paul talks about in Ephesians, it tearing down the, the walls and barriers that divide us. They're taking that to heart. They're taking the idea that we should be a ministry of reconciliation to heart mm -hmm. in their practices, in their structures, um, in who it is that they hire as leaders, is who it is that they recognize as leaders, how they develop their leaders. It becomes a part of how they do business. The culture. Yeah. Yeah. I'm and sorry, say, say again, Sean? Culture. You're talking about culture. The church's culture is, is geared towards um, tearing down divisions, not just in one specific time period, but it's just a part of their agenda throughout, is what yes. you're saying. Yeah, so it permeates the agenda. So again, we're going back and forth between religious settings and educational settings. Um, as a principal, as a teacher, as an administrator, I've sat through several trainings around diversity. And, you know, um, I have an excellent superintendent I work well with and, and the central office is great. So if any of you guys see this, don't try and write me up. Uh, <laughs> but um, we was working with Glenn Singleton and um, he's a, he wrote a great book uh, called Courageous Conversations and relationships changed, you know, like people started to push back and, you know, all these different agendas started to come up and, um, you know, creating systems and structures in the DOE, from my experience, there's a lot of red tape and there's a lot of, you know, concerns around whether this is an appropriate place to have those conversations. Um, but for me, anyway, as a principal, and I'm proud of my staff, if you're not about that life, I, I don't hire you straight. And if you are in my school and you're not about that, eventually you leave and you go to a specialized school or a school that makes you feel better about yourself. Um, but the, the, the people that I hire, I make it very clear, we're gonna be talking about race a lot. Um, every time you grade a student, every time you interact with a parent, um, every little, everything you do, it's going to be scrutinized. And the goal there is just to make people feel comfortable and leave or change. Um, so <laughs> that's what I like. I just, I love to agitate. It's just, it's fun. Um, but in terms of education, because I do want you to start having conversations with the central office, the superintendent's office. Um, Talk to me about what systems and structures work in educational settings in terms of social justice. And, and what are some things we might want to just get rid of? It, it's just not working or hasn't mm. worked. 
Yeah, I'll tell you what, what I've helped to develop and, and to, I wanna be honest and critical of, of the things that I'm doing. So I'm at the Delphi University and for three years, I've implemented a program called the Diversity Certificate Program. It was designed before I took my current role, but I, I took it, uh, added some other design elements and rolled it out. So it's a learning program. It's a learning program that every employee that as faculty, as well as, as um, administrators, everyone who is employed by the university is strongly encouraged to attend a series of workshops. Uh, they build upon each other. They, be, they, begin, they begin with cultural competency. They address racism. They address implicit bias. Title IX, right? We, we all have to be concerned about Title IX because that's, that's relevant to, to schools and education. Uh, if privilege. Title IX, just, you know, again, so people understand what that is. Oh, they're, they're, Title IX essentially are, is, the, is the federal law that says that if you receive federal money for education, you cannot discriminate based on, on, on race. Actually, it started out as um, gender, okay? But then um, other, uh, other classes were built onto it. So that's essentially what Title IX is. Uh, so we now have this learning program. Well, Adelphi has received the HEAT Award. It's a higher education uh, excellence award because of programs like this. Okay, that's all good and proper, but let me be critical of that. Although we're a university that has been really in a lot of ways leading the ways around diversity, equity, inclusion, and you can see that in our culture, and here, here's, here's the critical side of it. You, once you ignite the culture and you say, this is what our values are, and you put it out there and you celebrate your wins, watch out because it starts to expose your gaps. And I'm sorry, I'm gonna be pretty academic about this, but it starts to expose, here's culture on, on my left hand and culture is who we say we are or what we say we believe. This applies to educational institutions as well as churches. <laughs> who we say we are, what we say we believe, right? And climate. Climate is different. Climate is when you ask the people who are members of the, the, the group, how do really, how do things really go down around here? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. And so there's a delta or a difference between climate and culture. And can I tell you, Sean, if the mm -hmm. delta is small, in other words, if the climate is pretty close to matching what we say we are or who we say we are, there's usually peace, there's harmony but it takes a lot of work to get there. If the Delta is really wide, there's tension. Because you went ahead and said, this is what we really are. And the people inside are saying this, we are not this. And it builds incredible tension. So well, let, me, let me ask about that. So, and, and I know you're probably gonna go into this some more. Why is it, why is it so, I know for me, for example, right? I believe that I'm something that I'm probably not. If you ask somebody in my staff, they'll be like, yeah, he's a great guy, but I'm, and I'm okay with it. Like, I, I don't mind, it doesn't bother me like, cause I, I, in my mind, I'm not perfect as it is. My old students that are here, my, my teachers, uh, they'll tell you he's far from perfect, um, but I'm okay with it. Why is it difficult? Cause again, we're talking about leadership. Why is it difficult? Why is that conversation so difficult, right? Why is it? so difficult from your experience around religious leaders and educational leaders, why is it so difficult for us to simply hear you're not necessarily doing the best job? What is that? Like, I think, you know, my personal take on it is I'm never going to do the best job in everyone's eyes. I can only be my very best self and I'm not going to please everyone. And I take what you say with a grain of salt, but what you say is not the words of, of God himself, because you're a human being, you have bias, you have a certain perspective that, that kind of guides the way you see things. So you know what, you, you said something I didn't feel good about, and I really dislike that. Let's have a conversation. I'll try and be better. It doesn't turn into, for me, 
it is rarely turned into, oh yeah, now I hate you. And now you're evil. And I have to figure out a way to fire you now because you hurt my feelings mm. or we're not besties. Mm. Uh, the majority of my, <laughs> a lot of my staff are veteran teachers and they, they rarely <laughs> agree <laughs> with some of the things I got going on, but it's done respectfully based on their experience. So I, I always wondered like, what, what is that? I know that the easy answer is pride, whatever, but just your, your own thoughts. Like what, what happens there with educational leaders and religious leaders? Yeah, I'm going to separate them because I think although they have a lot in common, here is one that uh, deserve, deserves to be very distinctive. A phenomenon that I think is very distinctive among religious leaders is, is, is that they are placed on a pedestal that is artificial. It is it is not realistic, and that the and you know in some churches the only way they can get a ministry post is to demonstrate that they're okay with living on that pedestal. In essence, living a lie, living a false assumption about their own perfection, or their their own sinlessness. And I tell you something that sets them up for the greatest fall. Yeah, because now they're on this this artificial pedestal, right? They can't allow themselves to fall. Right. It's and painful to watch. Yes, it is, and and they can't allow themselves to fall. But they're so isolated on the top of the pedestal that they cannot be reached. Right. You and I can't stand there and break their fall. They're way above our heads. It, it's a prison. Is a prison of your own making. Is what. Yeah, I it's a false dichotomy. Yeah, and, and so the the does that happen? Do you feel the same way? I'm sorry. Do you feel like it's the same way in terms of educational leaders or teachers? Do, do we also um, place ourselves on that pedestal or like what? Because I've seen it. Like, is this competitiveness amongst educators to be like the best? And I always felt like yeah, that's so that's very high schoolish. Like, I'm not trying to be at the cool table type of thing. But I don't know, but go ahead. I'm just, just thinking. Yeah, and I think that's what we all may have in common across both groups is that our striving to be the best can also be self-isolating, right? Uh, I, there's nothing wrong with striving to be the best. Sean, I never flatter you, but I always tell you the truth about you. And I always say to you, and if, if you ever call me ever saying, I think you're better than I am. And that's the goal in my relationship with the people that I mentor is I honestly believe that you're better than me, that I get to walk alongside you and prove myself right. <laughs> you know, and, and maybe my ego's in that too, because I get to, to say, yeah, you know, I knew him when. Mm -hmm. um, but, but isn't that the joy, but let's stop there. Isn't that the joy of leading is to raise others above you and to be a part of that I just feel like at a certain age, I know for me anyway, there's a bunch of guys I mentor. I mentor um, teachers, principals, and everything else. And I have the same feeling of this guy is going to be amazing because he's 10 times better than me in all of these different categories. And I'm not saying it to flatter him. Like I think about, uh, there's a bunch of names, Dexter, Kyle, Matt, Rick, um, all these guys in education. And Kyle, for example, this dude is a poet. He has all this fashion stuff going on and spoken word, and he's nice to people. <laughs> and I just look at him like, and he's spiritual. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm just like, you remember him, Jennifer and Euphosa, son. Um, oh, and wow. I just, look at him and I'm like, he is amazing. He's the future. Yeah. I don't feel a need to compete with him in any way. I, I don't even want to. I, I'd rather just kind of be a part of his greatness. But I, I feel like whether in education or in religious settings, for all the guys, like it's okay not to be on that pedestal anymore. It's okay, you're going to be all right. Give somebody the opportunity, raise someone up and, and don't become the old sage on the stage.
Is yeah, but to tear down the so that pedestal looks like a lot of the pillars that support the church systems. The idea mm -hmm. of infallibility. You know, we think that we protested enough to be Protestants and then evangelicals and move far away from, from the roots of Catholicism. Ah, eh, we're not that far removed. <laughs> we still <laughs> brought some things along. We still have popes, you know, we still have piety, you know, we still have people. Who, who feel like their, their leadership is their right and their privilege. I mean, and, and, and then when, when the voices of the real leaders, right? Remember the real influencers, when the voices of the real influencers challenge that, well, what happens? The power from on high comes down upon our heads, hmm. right? Uh, so these systems, these structures, have existed uh, for antiquity. Uh, what you're seeing now in the public realm, let me, let me talk about the climate that we're on. Why are we seeing these protests? Why are you and I and, and uh, our children marching right now? I think there's a spirit of enough is enough and there's a growing sense of, uh, of a personal responsibility to tear down these structures, not to be tearing them down to be destructive, but actually tearing them down to be constructive. It's building something out of the rubble. Mm. And, and, and so if you're going to be a leader based on these definitions, these influencers, you've got to be willing to tear down barriers, but also to build something with them out of the rubble. So I, I wanted to, to stop right there. So. The other thing is, you know, I have white friends whom, whom I love, I care very deeply for, that have helped me along my journey, study the Bible with me, my brothers and sisters in Christ, co-workers, and sometimes I guess they listen to, 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 to the things that I have to say. Um, and I, I had this conversation with a friend of mine, and they're trying to figure out what do we do, right? You know, they work in the Department of Education and they want to be a part of change or they're in church and they feel kind of like, you know, I want to be a part of change. Um, what advice do you have for uh, white brothers and sisters and also white educators that are working with black and brown children mm -hmm. during this time? What's the best thing that they should do in terms of their leadership, their education, engaging parents and students? Sean, have you heard the saying, the more you know, the more you know you don't know? <laughs> you got your PhD now, right? And, and let me see if, if this is familiar to you. Wasn't there a part of that process where all the things, all the, the ways you learned up until then had to be blown up? See, the ways that you Absolutely. learned up until you got your PhD was, particularly in master's program by design, is that you learn the accepted theories and you learn yeah. how to regurgitate them and even apply them, right? Yes. And if you yes. do that, then you have mastership. When you get into a PhD program, what do they teach you? <laughs> learn it and blow it up because you have a responsibility to co contribute to the body of knowledge. Theory is you not complete understanding. It's the beginning of understanding. And you learn of the subjectivity and the nuance. Yes. And, and the variables, right? The variability of things. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. You got to understand that for most of people's ex educational experience, they never get taught what you got taught in a PhD program. To, to learn and then to deconstruct what they, they learned. So the, if you've go, gone through a rigorous doctoral program, you get to this epiphany moment where you go, okay, I know a lot of stuff. And that tells me that there's, a, there's so much more that I don't know. Yes. Okay. Now to it's directly answer your question. Humbling. It, is, it is humbling. <laughs> and it, I, it I don't, is. Not to stop, I, let, me not, let me cut in for a little bit, but going through that process, I don't know if people realize how humbling it is because what you realize is that you are an expert in this. Yeah. <laughs> so when people you feel talk this about this big too, you feel you know, this big. 
Yeah, and so when people topics, you just kind of go, I, I haven't studied it all the way out, mm -hmm. uh, but this is what I could contribute. And and so you know you you find like okay this is my lane this is my little piece of information that I know and you actually actually for whoever's thinking about going into the program actually it is exciting when somebody proves your theory wrong it's fun so when you you know study this thing out and then they give you a piece of information or a piece of of, of research that you didn't look up you're like oh oh great this is great and you don't get defensive about it you're like man i'm gonna add this yeah. to what i know so right. it's a fun experience so right, well, go ahead so here's my belief this might be an over exaggeration but i'm being theoretical um i'm being um i'm being uh i've lost the word so here we go black people in america have been studying oppression for 400 years mm. The average black person in America has a PhD in what it means to be oppressed. And rarely ever have I ever met a white person that has anything compared in terms of my learning. So if a white person wants to learn about racialized oppression in America, they need to go back to school. They need to find somebody like a Sean Brown who's willing to love them and teach them. And you know what? They know, especially I'm talking to your friends in the in the in your friends and my friends in education. You all know what it takes to learn. We know we are the experts in how to learn. We have to apply that to ourselves if we really want to become anti-racist. We have to apply learning theory to ourselves. We yes. have got to come to an understanding that the more we know, the more we know we don't know. Sean, yes. teach me. Sean, show me. Yes. And there are people like yourself and like myself who are willing to walk alongside mm -hmm. them, not, not dictate to them, not blame them, but walk alongside and educate them pull them into the circle of leadership around this issue. Yeah, and I think also, and this is something that I want to be clear about, there are the white folks I've interacted with, they, they want to learn. There's a lot. There's a lot that's like, hey, you know what? I'd like to learn more. My first, my best interaction with a white male in terms of understanding race was uh, my guy, Joshua Good, Mennonite, uh, living in Lancaster and he come down, he became a principal out in South Shore High School. And he would really ask, hey, Sean, brother, what's all these tattoos about, brother? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yo, it's, it's swag, man. You just, you just don't have any, all right? Going, you know, <laughs> your khakis are too tight. But we had great conversations about it and we'd argue. We'd argue, we'd debate, we'd go back and forth. And at the end of it, we figure out a way to be united. The other thing that's interesting for me is I really hope that Black folks who are listening and Latino folks who are listening do not assume that the cancer of racial, racial ideology does not live with inside of you. Mm. Uh, you know, Paulo Freire says it, you know, one thing that oppressed people do is they mimic the behaviors of the oppressor. Yeah. It is just, you, you've learned how to climb up specific social ladders to get to certain places. And you now use the same abuse on others that has been used against you. And, you know, I don't know what your thoughts are on that in terms of black folks, even black or brown folks who really, they, they have experiences, they have a narrative, um, but that may also be infected uh, in some ways. What are your thoughts on that for, for Black folks who educators and also those in the religious circles? Like, for example, you'll speak to a brother um, and say, hey, bro, you know, we need to do more than just kind of praying and holding hands. We need to act. Ah, brother, just, you know, trust, pray, you know, just dream. And then one day you're going to wake up and everything is going to be different. Or you speak to someone in the educational system 
that's black or brown. He said, hey, we need to act. We need to mobilize. We need to organize. And they say, yeah, man, but, uh, you know, that's that's not my job. You know, my job is to teach this thing. What do you what do you think? What are your thoughts about that? So you, you reference an author who's. Uh, seminal book was life-changing to me. So we should probably tell everybody who we were talking about. The book, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Everybody should read that book. Again, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Another recommendation is this one, Divided by Faith. You read those two books, if you really wanna learn and, and, and change your trajectory around the issue of racial oppression, I think you should start with those books. Uh, so COVID-19 has given us the perfect analogy. Um, Sean talked about, you know, being infected. So virology is, is, is the perfect place to illustrate the, the, the impact of race, racialization on everyone who comes in contact with it. Let me just break some news to you. Everyone who has come in contact with racialization has it in their system. Yeah. Even if you're asymptomatic, <laughs> even if you're one of them people who say, well, I don't see color. Well, one of the symptoms of racialization is colorblindness. So you just told me you got it in your blood when you say that. Color on yourself. <laughs> um, yeah. Everybody is, is carrying it. It eats at us. So we, if you lock one of us alone in the room with a mirror, believe me, and I say, uh, I mean, every human being who's come in contact with ra racialization, whether black or white, lock you alone in a room for, for, with a mirror for long enough, you're going to start hating the way you look. Because you're com comparing it to some sort of ideal. You, you've determined in your mind that there are yeah. people who look better, it's a class of people or a type of look that is better than you, guess what? You're manifesting symptoms of racialization. Mm. The symptoms vary. The symptoms vary from, from self-destructive behavior, self-loathing, to other loathing, or ethnocentrism, or prejudice. All of these terms intersect and live because this virus of racialization live, uh, lives within us. Mm. So no one is immune to it, Sean. We're all infected. Mm. And you know, I, we're gonna wrap up in a little bit. And I just wanted to say a couple of things to you publicly while everybody is watching. Um, I love you. You have inspired many. Uh, if you've been around long enough, you should know Brian. Uh, he, you know, now it's kind of cool to uh, talk about these things, but he spoke about them way before it was cool. And in many ways, he paid a price. There's so many, you know, I want to have another conversation about um, our heroes, people like Greg Jones, uh, Eddie Jodesti, uh, Henry How There's so many people that have talked about these things within churches um, and because of righteous reasons decided to make other decisions. And I just wanted to tell you, I love you now. For a lot of us who are scrolling through, who needs a little bit of shucking and jiving, a little bit of entertainment, this is not that. Um, this is about sitting and learning and listening. Um, you can go back to your music or whatever it is at another time. Um, but this is where knowledge is, is kind of created and understood. And I really do hope that, you know, if you get the chance, reach out to Mr. Leander. Um, I'm speaking specifically to leaders. When you get the opportunity, look him up, speak with him um, and see how he can help you. And it's always good talking with you, dude. Um, I don't wanna go too long past an hour, but you are a breath of fresh air. You are um, somebody that I try my best to imitate. And I'm not gonna shave my beard like that. Um, that's not cool. Hey, but, if, Jennifer, if Jennifer says you're gonna shave that beard, you're gonna shave that beard. Yeah, well, I'm gonna do whatever she says. She's Haitian, <laughs> so I don't want that problem. But um, I just want to tell you I love you.
That's all I wanted to say. Yeah, well, I love you too. And it, and just for the, for the audience's sake, this ain't the first time we've told each other we love each other. We probably end every conversation with that. So whatever you okay. make of that, you make of that. Oh, yeah. I love you too. That's all right. I love you, bro. Take it easy. Right. Thanks, guys, for tuning in. And I'll see you next week at some point. We're going to be having, I think my man Raheem is on the line. We're going to be having conversations. Um, somebody's asking us to keep going. Uh, <laughs> it's okay. Um, Maybe we'll do a part two, Sean. We'll do a part two. I, you know, he he's really into his wife and his kids and taking care of business on a Sunday. Um, next week, we're going to be having a conversation. Oh, I'm sorry. There's questions from the audience. Let's do it. Okay. Oh, God. Nobody wants to do this. I was trying to go to this rally. <laughs> I was I was trying to go to this rally with the wife. Um, <laughs> what uh some people have some questions. I'm trying to look at the chat and see what questions. Anybody has questions? Our school is currently okay. Somebody write something. How can I like scroll through this thing? Hold on, Brian. I'm so sorry. That's Dr. Leander to you. Dr. Leander. Oh, no, you were the newly minted Sean Brown, Dr. Sean Brown. So we're on first name basis again. Oh, yes, 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 yes. My man Raheem is here. His wife is actually, this is what I wanted to say. Um, Next week, Raheem, his wife is going to be, I'm trying to get her on to talk about marriage during uh, COVID-19 and parenting. Okay. Um, probably you could talk a little bit about that, man. Like how I probably, would, things... I probably won't be able to add anything good to that one. <laughs> <laughs> Got to figure it out. Thank God for the gracious uh, wives that you have is what I would say. That's what I would say too. I don't even know how I'm still married to Jennifer. Lord have mercy. I'm like <laughs> the worst. I'm saying I feel bad for her. You ever look at your wife and just feel bad for her? Like, yeah. Oh my like, God. That's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man um that's pretty much it nobody else all right so i'm gonna get off now jennifer keeps saying to answer questions i don't see the questions jennifer uh oh she also said i cut in too much and i need to stop talking so much very nice ah uh, so yeah that's pretty much it um I'll let it end here. I think it was a great conversation. Tune in next week as we talk about marriage. I know there's a lot of us who um, are on the brink of doing some things that we probably don't want to do. Sean, and, man, um, it seems that yes, people are asking about the book I recommended. So it's called Divided oh, wow. by, by Faith. It's Divided by Faith. The author is Michael O. Emerson and Christian okay. Smith, two authors, Michael Emerson and Christian Smith, Divided by Faith. Oh, somebody had a question. I'm sorry. Um, thanks for the book recommendation. Um, somebody wanted access to your slides um, with the scriptures, and somebody asked, like, what's the proper way to challenge leadership, um, both in education and also in church? What's what do you recommend as like, what practicals can you give us? Mm. Okay, that's a great question. If that's like the only question, that's a great one because at the end of the day, there's some cautions about how to, to challenge, as you say, leadership. And one of the cautions is to approach them in a way that challenges them without them feeling challenged. So it's usually trying to take a more direct conversational approach about it. Be very clear with them about what you want to talk about. So here's how I'll role play with you, Sean, real quickly. I'm, I'll, I'm an assistant principal. You're a principal. I have a particular issue to challenge you uh, around race. And I say to you, Dr. Brown, uh, I have uh, a thought in mind that I want to share with you and to get your thoughts on it as well. Can you and I have some dialogue about race, particularly the racial climate here at Adelphi University where I work? 
So in that very succinct moment, I've made clear to that person exactly what my subject is, is, but also I've pulled them into it by saying, I have some thoughts and I want to hear yours. Now, I know I'm trying to be succinct because we don't have a whole lot of time. And this is, a, this is a, a question that usually takes a lot of coaching sessions to really get people to become very good at it. But I think if you can see the principle of it is that you are as, willing to put forward your own thoughts as you are willing to accept the thoughts of other people. But what if, let's say, okay, let's use me as an example. Um, and staff members have said this, so I'll use myself. Um, you know what, I do want to speak to Brown, but he's intimidating. And he's not going to listen. He's dismissive. And he'll probably just give me a bunch of yeses and not truly listen so i just don't even feel the need to say mm -hmm. anything like i'll just let whatever happened happen what, what do you say to that well that's their own prejudice that's prejudicial that's not on brown then that's on them mm. get some courage set your prejudices aside practice what you're about to preach i'm sorry i, I take a pretty hard line with that because <laughs> That is, yeah, it just kind of went left. B, what's going on? <laughs> you just went off. All right, but go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, PC. Because, because those are the excuses that people make for not doing the right thing. Well, Brown is this, that, 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 that. He might have been that yesterday. Who knows? He had a good night's sleep last night, and he's different today. You still have to give him the benefit of, of the truth as you want the benefit of the truth for yourself. That's the only way to challenge leadership. All right. Um, another person asked, well, another person asked, I don't want to say this, but another person asked, what if you have already been labeled as, and this is for, you know, educational divisive, I'm sorry, educational or religious settings. This person is divisive. This person is angry um they just want to fight they you know the way that they said this you seem kind of aggressive you know like all of the different yeah all of you know, all the fun phrases that you know is is totally masking another issue but what do you say to that person that because it's easy to say well you know you shouldn't judge but if you've been slapped a thousand times for speaking That's, you, you know, can make a legitimate judgment right it's not healthy to tell people they shouldn't judge. If you're gonna, if you're gonna judge, make a sound judgment. Telling people that they shouldn't judge is another way of oppressing them. <laughs> we have been given, you know, Jesus. I don't remember the scripture, but where he says, "Come, let's reason." He wants us to be able to reason with people. We've been given reason. That is what makes us different than the squirrel running up, running around outside. So be reasonable, use your ability to reason, but know that if people wanna shut you down, they're usually, their playbook in shutting you down is pretty easy to read. Labeling you as divisive, labeling you as a threat, labeling you and me, Sean, we're, we're big bald headed black men as being threatening or intimidating. We know what that means. Yeah. Right? um and, i think and, and, please go for ahead me no i'm just saying like for me, me in terms of my journey i've become numb to criticisms in that way hmm. i literally do not care about any subjective opinion at all about who i am as an educator or as a christian i don't care and the reason is because you know like I don't know if I've been through so much that it's kind of like the bullets don't phase me. It's kind of like it's like you can almost time it. You can time what's going to be said: aggressive, divisive, prideful, and so it's just kind of like it keeps going on and on and on. So I get to a point where I'm like, okay, I get it already. We're just we just want to avoid this topic right here, and we have have these different catchphrases to make sure that we don't get to that core. So I, and the reason, and the way that I've become numb to it is through reading about this and putting it in proper context, right? 
you don't get permission to be a revolutionary from your oppressor. Your oppressor does not give you permission to revolutionize something. That's not how it works. And I think a lot of times we're waiting for someone who doesn't necessarily have our best interests in mind to give us, a, give us permission to go against them. That is not smart. It's not how it works. A lot of things that we do in education and also in religious settings, it's a copycat thing. People kind of climb on to whatever works. So if we, if we have this conversation at first, it's kind of like, ah, I don't know if this is wise. He worships somewhere else, you worship somewhere else, I don't know. But then when it starts to heal people and help people spiritually, hey, you know, what we was thinking about doing was creating an, an environment. <laughs> It's like, yo, <laughs> you, 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 you stop. You understand what I'm saying? So I feel like I'm, I'm not, I'm not there anymore. Probably, you know, 14, 15 year old version of me was like, yeah, I, I don't want to lose this persona, but I, I don't have it anymore. We have to do like, why would I go and ask somebody 10 blocks away if I can give my brother a cup of water if he's thirsty and he's next to me? That's not what smart people do. My brother's next to me, he needs help, I'm going to help him. And then we could talk about what you think about it later. And that's why I'm at spiritual, but go ahead. Yeah, so yeah. the significance of this moment for me is that uh, 401 years ago, February of this year, uh, the first ship with 20 black souls arrived here in the Americas souls for, for sale. 400 years later, the oppression that precipitated that event still lives to today in the education system and in the church. It is a virus. So we're talking about two, two places where it lives, but it, it also infects everyone within that. That's the significance of this moment for me. Here's, what, here's why I say all of that to answer the question you just asked. The, the solution that we may be seeking may never be given to us. It's not why it is we fight. We don't fight because we expect to win. We fight because it's God's agenda. It's his fight. Justice, righteousness is his fight. So we've got to just play our part knowing that we are fighting along with the creator of the universe. It's not our fight. That gives us comfort when we're rejected. That gives us comfort when we're marginalized. That gives us comfort when we don't see what we hope for. I agree. It's not about the result. It's about the journey. It's about the journey. And it's about, are we in the fight? Cool. All right. And with that, um, I think we can end now. Okay. Guys, thanks for tuning in. Next week, we will be speaking about marriage. And this is a, this is a platform to build bridges with different people, with different levels of expertise. We thank you for joining in. Um, for those of us who are silent, just kind of looking in and like, oh, snap, Brian Leander, he's still faithful. <laughs> yeah, he's still Brian. Uh, reach out to him. If you had a <laughs> friendship with him, if you knew him in some type of way, he's still Brian. He 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 taught us all about the emperor's new clothes a couple of years. <laughs> Time to get off this call. <laughs> I love you. Take it easy. All right, man. All right, bye.